And we learned an exponent law yesterday. And we'll review that law. First, though, let's talk about exponents. So this thing right here, 2 to the power of 3, has a name. That thing is not an exponent. That thing is a power. Right? The whole thing is called a power. And it had two parts. One of those parts is the exponent. And one of those parts is the base. The base would be the number 2 here. And the little number up top, that's your exponent. Cool. Good to just have the right terminology down, right? So when I say write it as a power, you understand I'm talking about that whole expression. When I say what's the exponent, you understand I'm talking about the little number. When I say what's the base, you understand I'm talking about the big number. Beautiful. What does an exponent mean? What does it tell us to do? What's it saying to us? Yeah, times two by two to nine. Yes, it's saying take the base which is 2, and multiply it by itself three times. That's what 2 to the power of 3 means. right? It's saying take the base, multiply it by itself three times. Awesome. This led us to creating our first exponent law, was we took something like this, and we said, okay, well, what that truly means, what that really means is that there's three M's here all multiplying together times there's two M's here multiplying together times there's four M's here multiplying together. That's what's really going on here. It's just a whole lot of M's multiplying together. And we could write those as a single power by understanding that there's a total of 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 m's. That means we could turn this into m to the power of 9, which would be the same thing as saying m to the power of 3 plus 2 plus 4, which is m to the power of 9. Our first rule was when you're multiplying bases, you add exponents. And he has ripped through that stuff. And for the most part, I think we did pretty good. It should have been reviewed for the most part too, which is kind of nice, right? It's a slow way to start. We got a couple questions extra here. So if we look over here, this is b to the power of 2, or b squared, times b to the power of 1. Right? There's an invisible 1 right there. Times b to the power of 3. If I want to write that as a single power, that's b to the power of 2 plus 1, plus 3, which is b to the power of 6. That would be a single power, or a simplified power. That's typically the word we use, simplified. Then we did some division. So our division law, if we think about it, was this x to the power of 8 means that there's 8 x's multiplying together. This x to the power of 3 means there's 3 x's multiplying together. And we realized that we could then just write these things by figuring out which side would have more. If the top had 8 and the bottom had 3, that means the top has more and it has 5 more. So that would simplify to be x to the power of 5. The technical math formula that we learned was that when you're doing division, you can subtract the exponents. So when you're dividing the base, you subtract the exponents. I almost never actually use that subtraction rule. I just use the rule and logic of it of saying, okay, there's five more on the top than there is on the bottom. That means I should have x to the power of five on the top of my fraction. That thing is still technically a fraction. It's just there's nothing in the denominator, so we wouldn't write anything there. You could write an invisible one if you're like, oh, I see, it's still on the top of a fraction to help you out a little bit. Cool, this one. We then got into these weird situations where sometimes we had more than one operation happening. So for instance, if you look at the denominator of this one, the denominator, the bottom of the fraction, 
has multiplication on it. So we should combine those using the multiplication rule first and then do the division rule. So if we combine those, that would give me n to the power of 8 on top still. And the denominator would be n to the power of 13 because 8 plus 5 is 13. Yes, sir. Okay. Then we try to combine the top and the bottom. We do that by technically using the subtraction rule, but if you did that, that gives you a negative exponent, and we don't like having negative exponents. So instead, I logically try to think this through. If there's 8 ends on the top and there's 13 ends on the bottom, where should my remaining ends be? They should be on the bottom because there's more of them there, right? So when I make my fraction, my ends are going to be on the bottom. How many more were on the bottom than the top? So it's n to the power of 5. Because there was 5 more on the bottom than on the top. Perfect. We have nothing left up here. So what do we have to put there? Yeah, we've got to put a 1, right? We've got to put a placeholder of some sort. That is a simplified expression. Yeah, man. Oh, he's good. So it's 1 divided by n to the power of 5. Cool. That's everything we did yesterday. So if you missed yesterday, you're now caught up. Today, we're going to look at um, a few more examples of what we did yesterday. We're just going to get a little tricky because we're going to start adding some coefficients, which is going to be new to us, which we haven't handled before. And then we're going to move on to a new law. Okay, so we'll start off with um, this one. Whoa. That's not going to be good for the old video. Just a little clip over to Power School if you're watching this video right now. <laughs> you should have a bracket 2 times x to the power of 2. What did I put there? 4 times 3x to the power of 5. Perfect. This one. Okay. What this means. There's nothing in between them, right? So if there's nothing in between anything here, what this means is 2 times x to the power of 4 times 3 times x to the power of 5. That's the same thing, right? Like There's nothing in between here. There's no additions, no subtractions, and we know that that just means multiplication. Yeah, so you're just creating the equation. Yeah, I'm just like making the exact same thing. Just like showing the way it could look. If we do that, it'll help us recognize a couple things. The first thing it'll help us recognize is that these x's can be combined together. Right? We already kind of knew that. We knew that the same letters go with same letters. So if I have x to the power of 4, x to the power of 5, that'll be x to the power of 9. So that's not new to us. What is new to us is these coefficients. Coefficients are numbers that are in front of multiplication. Yeah, that's the term I'll use, coefficient. So in this case, I have two coefficients. I have a coefficient of 2, and I have a coefficient of 3. Coefficients can go together. So you could actually multiply the bases. 2 times 3 would be 6. So this thing would simplify to be 6, x to the power of 9. The numbers, the bases can go together, and then the letters can combine together. So if you look at the one below, the way I would solve this, it's all being multiplied together. There's no additions or subtractions. So that means my numbers can go together. 5 times 4 would equal 20. Then I can move on to my letters. This is x to the power of 1. This is x to the power of 2. 1 plus 2 is x to the power of 3. My next letter, y to the power of 1, y to the power of 3, would become y to the power of 4. Numbers go together, letters go together by adding the exponents. 
Yes, sir. Yeah, you could have like infinite. So you could have a lot of them, right? And that does happen sometimes. Not very often, but sometimes, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I'm times in the five and the four. So five times four is 20. And I always try to, you guys will notice, I was like, I'll underline things. So I kind of like color code them, right? So I underline the red to kind of show you what created the red. So I will try to color code things a little bit. So if you're completely lost, maybe you can look up and the colors match up for you. Sometimes it's hard, but I try. So if we look up here, this is now division. But the same rules are going to apply for the coefficients. So when I'm looking at this division question, the coefficients can go together. But now it's dividing. So 6 divided by 3 is 2. Then I do my letters. x to the power of 4 divided by x to the power of 1 would be x to the power of 3. My next letters, y to the power of 5, y to the power of 2 means y to the power of 3. And notice that all the numbers are on top of my fraction, and there's nothing left on the bottom. Everything kind of got used up, right? If you wanted, you could put divide by 1 if you wanted to still see that there's something on the bottom. I won't ever write that, but if you want to see it there, you can. Yes, sir? Uh, actually, I'm not sure about that. All right, you're good. This one. This one's trickier. Um, this one's tricky because you have two coefficients that don't go together. With multiplication, it's nice because the coefficients always go together. Right? You can always multiply two numbers, but you can't always divide two numbers. Right? 10 doesn't divide by 8, at least not nicely. So when you have two coefficients and they're dividing and the two numbers don't match up, what you need to do is look at those numbers and try to figure out what's the biggest number that divides into both of them. Oh, you're doing uh, 80, so 40 will go into 80. Close, look at just the number. So like just the number 10, what numbers can divide into 10? And then just the number eight, what numbers can divide into eight? Can two. Two. Two can divide into 10? Two can divide into eight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you'd put them together and then do a bigger number, right? And that's fine. Um, you're just doing them individually. So that means what I need to do is I need to divide both those numbers by 2. Because it's the biggest number that could divide into both of them. 10 divided by 2 would give me 5. 8 divided by 2 would give me 4. Yeah, of course. That is hard. So coefficients that don't match up nicely and divide, those are tricky. That's called simplifying your coefficients. Your letters, I have x to the power of 3, x to the power of 1. I would have two more on the top. My next letter, I have y to the power of 1 on the top, y to the power of 4 on the bottom. My y's are going to be on the bottom because there's more on the bottom. And the exponent will be 3 because there's 3 more on the bottom. That would be my simplified expression. I'll let you look at that for a second because that, that's a hard one. That's harder than anything we did yesterday. And if there's a question you have, I mean, now's the time to ask it before we get into like the madness that's about to happen. Him. Why did you divide by three? Um, to simplify those coefficients. So we always want to try, it's called like reducing, right? So I always want to try to reduce these numbers to as small as possible. And to do that, you find the biggest number that divides into both of them. Now, like realistically, I could divide 10 by 5, but I can't divide 8 by 5. So I don't. But I can divide both of them by 2. Yeah, you're like taking it out, right? You're taking out that two to give you that. Realistically, five can be four. 
It's a shorter form. Yeah, it's like a, it's like a shorter form of writing it. They're equivalent, equivalent fractions. It's tricky. That stuff's hard. That stuff like at even in 30, like it's a simple rule that people just like struggle with. It's just hard. All right. Today's rule. Um, today's rule is going to be what happens when you have exponents that have exponents. So that means you got like exponents on your exponents. I call it power of a power. That's what I'll refer to it as. Um, I know that's probably not like the actual technical term, but that's just the terms I use. So if you have something like this, like what does that mean? So what this means is that if you took your base and this whole thing, because it's in brackets, that's my base. This exponent tells me how many of those bases I have. So when I look at that, I'm like, what does that actually mean? Like, what's going on? What it means is that I have x, y squared three times. That's what it really means. So being able to identify the base is going to become very important to us. Then I could calculate this thing, right? So I have x, y squared, x, y squared, x, y squared. My x's can go together. My y squares can go together. I could combine this to become x to the power of 3. My y's, y squared, y squared, y squared, be y to the power of 6. And that would be my simplified expression. All I did there was I added my exponents, right? It's the same rules. This is x to the power of 1, x to the power of 1, x to the power of 1. 1 plus 1 plus 1 is 3. My y's y to the power of 2, y to the power of 2, y to the power of 2, 2 plus 2 plus 2 is 6. Cool. This does technically give us a rule. I call it again the power of a power law. So it's what you do when you have exponents with exponents. What we've done is we've taken that original question And we've essentially created three of each of these. So I have three of the twos, and I have three of the ones. So all I've done is I've taken this power on the outside, and I've multiplied it to the exponents on the inside. So that this became x to the power of 1 times 3, and y to the power of 2 times 3 to give me x to the power of 3, y to the power of 6. Same thing, right? One is using my new trick, where I'm like, oh, I just multiply exponents. The other is kind of showing why that works. That's called our power of a power law. You can see I've written those laws for you right here. This shows that the n goes to both. This shows that the n times by the n. Hey, Mackenzie. So, by that logic, could the n, like that little n, have a power? You could. Like, you could have a power, a power, a power. And we'll have some questions today where that'll happen. You're going to have exponents with exponents with exponents. And it just keeps trickling down. So, you can just keep multiplying those exponents on top of each other. Practically, like practicality, practically, in everyday life, it doesn't happen very often. Uh, but the power of a power does happen. We do see that. Okay, let's, uh, let's try some. So we're going to try to simplify some. If I had this, what that means, yeah? Pardon? 
Yeah, for sure. Sorry. What this means is that I have 4 squared 3 times, right? That means 4 squared, 4 squared, 4 squared. That's what it means. Which would simplify to be 4 to the power of 6. The quick way to do it, though, is to just realize when my exponent has an exponent, I multiply them together, which is 4 to the power of 6. Apparently, I write my exponents like big numbers now. Both get you the same answer. The much faster way is just to multiply. Yes, sir. Do you just get rid of the brackets? <laughs> yeah, and then the brackets go away. So once you, I like to call it using up the brackets. So once I bring these one in, I've used the brackets and they can go away. Yeah. Let's go down to this one. <coughs> I have an exponent <coughs> with an exponent. This four can come in to become two to the power of three times four. That is 2 to the power of 12. Not bad, right? C. That's x to the power of 3 to the power of 2. That 2 comes into the brackets. We have x to the power of 3 times 2, which means x to the power of 6. For D, we got something new. We got division going on inside the brackets. So when I bring that 3 in, that 3 goes to the exponent on the 2, and it goes to the exponent on the x. So this becomes 2 to the power of 3 divided by x to the power of 3. So the power goes to both things. The logical reason is because if I actually wrote this out, it would be 2 divided by x times 2 divided by x times 2 divided by x. And I'd have 3 2's on the top and 3 x's on the bottom. If I look at E, now there's three things in there. If I multiply this 5 in, it goes to all the exponents, including the exponent on that 3. So this becomes 3 to the power of 5, x to the power of 10, y to the power of 5. Right? I'm multiplying exponents. For f, I'm doing the same thing. So this 3 is going to go to that 3. It's going to go to the invisible 1 on the x. And it's also going to go to the invisible 1 on the 4. So this becomes x to the power of 3, y to the power of 9, because 3 times 3 is 9, and 4 to the power of 3. Wonderful. That's our power of a power law. I do want to show you that sometimes your answers don't get written like that, though. So, for instance, if we look at that uh, letter D, we're just going to examine that answer a little bit. That is right. Like, I've done nothing wrong here. But typically, that's not how we write things out. The reason being is that you have something that you can evaluate. So if you look, 2 to the power of 3, I can actually calculate that. I can evaluate it. 2 to the power of 3 means 2 times 2 times 2, right? Which we could put in our calculator. And if you do that, it equals 8. So typically, when we have numbers, we actually calculate the numbers. We don't leave the number as an exponent. 
So I would evaluate two to the power of three to come in. Same thing, right? It's just I've evaluated that that number. Yeah. Yeah, and we can do that for all of them, right? So if you look over here at f, that means f can actually change a little bit too. Because that 4 to the power of 3, I could evaluate that. I could put in my calculator. If I do that, 4 to the power of 3 is 64. I think. 4 times 4 is 16. 16 times 4 is 64. Yeah. We're sticking with it. It's my story. The top would stay as x3, y9. Yes, sir. Uh, in the future, if we do it the first step and like we put our answer down like that, would they uh, take a mark off for doing that? In, in all honesty, like if this, let's say it's a written response test, right? And you wrote your answer. And you wrote this. I'd give you 100%. If it was a multiple choice test, this might be the answer. It might be option A, right? Or this might be the answer. They won't both be there. But one of them will be. So you need to be able to understand, oh, they've calculated their exponent or their power. And that's why I show you both. If you did either one on a written response test, like I'm giving it to you. You clearly show me you know what you're doing. If we look up here, this one can be simplified too, right? We have 3 to the power of 5. So if I had that 3 to the power of 5, oh boy, that's going to test my brain a little bit. Uh, 3 times 3 is 9, times 3 is 27, times 3 is 71, 81, times 3 is 243, I think. Somebody has a calculator. Your calculator is a heck of a lot smarter than me. It is. Hey, a blind squirrel finds a nut, man. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. That's not always the truth. That's why you need your calculators. Wonderful. Okay. I'm going to send you off into the world. So there's 10 questions there. I want you to try to simplify all 10 of them. I know some of them are hard. Um, I'll give you a few minutes to try to finish up. Then I will go over them so you see if you're getting them right. Or if you got them wrong, you can figure out why you got them wrong. And then there's a couple, like, massive ones. And if you want to even go ahead of me and try the massive ones before I show you how, feel free. Yeah, you can. But for now, everyone's trying to finish number four that we miss. So the first few are pretty straight up. That's 2 to the power of 3 times 7 because the th 7 comes in to make it 2 to the power of 21. If you calculated that, it's like 65,000 or something crazy like that. You don't need to calculate those massive ones. You can just leave it as 2 to the 21. B, um, you guys look like you're crushing B, so the 3 comes in. Make sure it goes to both things. Right? There's invisible ones on both those X and those Y. To become X to the 3, Y to the 3. Fantastic. A question like C is one that we definitely don't do well on tests. Like, just historically speaking, that's one that tricks people. The reason it tricks people is they'll take that 2 and they'll bring it in, but they forget that it also has to go to the exponent on this 2. And it goes to the exponent, not the base. So that means it becomes 2 to the power of 2. Not 2 times 2, 2 to the power of 2. And then it's x to the power of 6. So just remember when you have coefficients, you have numbers, that those need to get the exponent as well. For D, same idea. Like the biggest answer I get on a test would be 15 divided by x cubed. That's the biggest answer I get on a test, and it's not correct. It's not correct because you were missing your exponent on the 15. The 3 has to go to both things. They become 15 to the power of 3 divided by x to the power of 3. That's correct. Okay, so be very careful with coefficients. We tend to miss them. 
The second biggest answer I get is people go 45 divided by x to the power of 3. And that's not correct either. This is not 15 times 3. This is 15 times 15 times 15, right? It's to the power of 3. So make sure you're doing exponents when you do this stuff. There goes the internet. Back to being fuzzy. Um, if you did E, that 2 comes in to make it 2 to the power of 2. X to the power of 2. Y to the power of 2. Figure if I write big enough, maybe you'll see it through the fuzziness of what I'm trying to do. <laughs> awesome. Honestly, walking around, like you guys were for the most part crushing it. There's um, those little mistakes with coefficients. That was about it. Like that was the only constant trend I was seeing. And sometimes there's little things. Right? Everyone makes little mistakes from time to time. But as long as you're getting the big concept, that's what matters. If we scroll over, I'll put the answers up quick so you can just make sure you got it right. Um, this 1 divided by x squared y cubed, that 4 does need to go to that 1. Now, it becomes 1 to the power of 4. If you calculate 1 to the power of 4, it's still just 1. Okay, so... That's one of those unique situations where maybe the exponent doesn't show up, but it did show up. It's just 1 to the power of 4 is still 1. In the denominator, you should have had that 4 come in. We have x to the 8, y to the 12. It's like you've taken your glasses off. So it's just a little fuzzy. All right, G. For G, the 3 has to come into the brackets. It goes to all the exponents. This is not 21. It is 7 to the power of 3. That's different than 7 times 3. So if you have 21, that's not correct. You want 7 to the power of 3. That's different. Then it's a to the power of 3. Then it's b to the power of 15. 7 to the power of 3, you could actually calculate. I think it's 343. Yeah. Um, 21 is the one that shows up a lot. But 21 is not correct. 21 is 7 times 3. I want to do 7 to the power of 3. 7 to the power of 3 is 343. Then I should have a to the power of 3, b to the power of 15. Cool. The last one I want to talk about um, kind of in depth is h. Because when you have a negative, it changes things. So when I look at h, that 2 has to come into the brackets. When it comes into the brackets, it goes to all the exponents. But when I write this out, my negative 3 needs to stay in brackets like that because I want the negative to be part of the base. The negative has to get the exponent too. If you don't have brackets, you're saying the negative is not part of the base and it's only 3 is part of the base. Those are two different things. So make sure that you're putting brackets around your negative numbers. Then it would be a to the power of 12, b to the power of 6. If you calculate your coefficient, negative 3 squared is positive 9. If you didn't put brackets, you would have got negative 9. Negatives and positives are very different things. The letters will stay the same. a to the 12, b to the 6. Wonderful. The last one I'll go through kind of quick. So the last one, oh, the last two, sorry. It would be 2 to the power of 6, a to the power of 4, x to the power of 2. And j, j would be x to the power of 6, x to the power of 10, y to the power of 4. On the top, we have two x's multiplying together. 
So we need to add those exponents. So we have x to the power of 16, y to the power of 4. Cool. That's called power of a power law. Exponents with exponents. I'm going to go through three questions that are kind of like, I don't know, we call them jacked up or beefed up, like they're a little bit harder. And then I do have a practice sheet so you guys can try to do some extra ones. Yeah, question. No. Oh, okay. All right. Let's look at number 5A. Okay, guys, gentlemen. Thank you. If you've already tried these ones, that's great. And then just check your answers. There is multiple ways to do these questions. Okay, so I, I'm going to show you my strategy on how I tackle them. Yeah. yeah. So the way I think most people would do it is they would look at this and they'd see an exponent on an exponent. And they would deal with that first. So they would take this 2 and they would bring it in to everything else. When they do that, they end up getting n to the power of 6, n to the power of 8, divided by n to the power of 2. Then, on the second one, they would see three exponents. And we haven't seen that yet. So the way that you tackle that is you're going to take your outside exponent and you're going to multiply it in. So 2 times 3 will become 6. And then you're going to bring that 6 in to become n to the power of 12. Yeah, Dishim. Can you get that 3 from? Oh, it should be a 4. Thank you. Does that help? Yeah? Okay, cool. Yes. <coughs> oh, man. What am I up to? I know. I'm just writing things out. I'm not doing my multiplying. There we go. You guys got to make sure you keep calling me out if you see things like that. Cool. Now, we have more exponent laws we can do. So, for instance, if I look, I have two things being multiplied together, and they're the same base. That means I could add those exponents, and that would become n to the power of 22. Everything else remains unchanged. I haven't done anything with this n to the power of 4 yet. I haven't done anything with this n to the power of 12 yet. The next rule I see is I see that I have division right here. So if I have 22 on the top and 4 on the bottom, that 22 minus 4 would become n to the power of 18. Notice that the n to the power of 12, still I've done nothing with, but I write it out every time. Now that I've taken that first fraction and done all those things to it, I'm left with n to the 18 and n to the 12. If there's no operation in between them, operation meaning like addition, subtraction, multiplication, if there's no operation here, what operation is it trying to tell you? Right. This is multiplication. So n to the 18 times n to the 12 means we add our exponents to give us a final answer of n to the 30. Some advice when doing a massive question like that. First piece of advice, do one thing at a time, rewrite your work. And I did one thing, I brought the exponent in, and then I rewrote all my work. Then I did one thing, I combined my tops, and I rewrote all my work. Then I did one thing, I subtracted, and I rewrote my work. It helps keep you organized. Usually, people who try to do two or three steps in one end up making a mistake somewhere. And if it doesn't happen in math 10C, it's probably going to start happening in math 20. And if it doesn't happen in math 20, it's going to start happening in math 30. But eventually, it'll catch up to you that you're not showing your steps. So make sure you show what's happening. Do something, write it out. Do something, write it out. 
My second piece of advice is work vertically. Okay, so you'll notice that I did something, I wrote it out. Then when I did something, I wrote it out again, but vertically, so I went below. Then I did something and I wrote it vertically, I wrote it below. I didn't go to the side, and then down, and then to the side, and then down, because then you start to lose track of where you're at. So try to keep things in a column. We had a math teacher who literally would, like, you lose marks if you didn't do that. So you had to do everything vertically or he took away marks from you. And honestly, it helped a ton because it forced you to stay organized. So go vertical so you stay organized. If you ever run out of space, then draw a line and start again at the top and then go vertical again. Right? But then at least you're keeping things organized. It'll go a long way. All right, we'll try B together. So I look at this one. I think people's first instinct would be dealing with that exponent on the outside. Whether or not I think that's the right first choice, I think is what most of you would do. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take that 2, and we are going to bring it in. And we bring it to all of our exponents. So this becomes x to the power of 8, y to the power of 4, x to the power of 2, y to the power of 10. The second brackets, I'm doing the same thing. The 3 comes in, and it becomes x to the power of 9, y to the power of 15, divided by x to the power of 9, x to the power of 15. I have two fractions here. What am I doing to those two fractions? Like, what's the operation in between the blue fraction and the red fraction? It's multiplying, right? This is multiplying. This times this. With fractions, when you're multiplying fractions, you can actually just make it one big fraction. So if you want, you could connect this to make it one big fraction. That's what multiplying does. It just makes one large fraction. And then we can start simplifying again. So if I look at the top, on the top, I have x to the power of 8, x to the power of 9 would become x to the power of 17. If I look at my y's, I have y to the power of 4, y to the power of 15. That's y to the power of 19. If you already did this question and you didn't do it like this, it doesn't mean you're wrong. Okay, They're, Wait until we see the final answer because you might have been right and just did it a different way. In the denominator, I have x to the power of 2, x to the power of 9, x to the power of 15. I can add all those together to become x to the 26. The y to the power of 10 nothing changes because there was no other y's in the denominator to multiply it with. Now what should I do? Yeah. 26 was by adding the exponents on all those x's because there's three x's on the bottom now, right? So there's 2 plus 9 plus 15, which gave me 26, because there was three x's this time. Yeah, okay. Yeah, now I'm going to do my division. So if I look at my fraction, I have x's on the top, I have x's on the bottom. The bottom has more. So because the bottom has more, my answer should go on the bottom for my x's. And the bottom had 9 more. So it should be x to the power of 9 in the denominator. My y's, if I look at my y's, I have y to the 19 on the top, y to the 10 on the bottom. The top has more, so the top should get my y's. And in this case, it also has 9 more. So this is y to the 9, x to the 9. And that should be my final answer. If 
Fantastic. Just wonderful. Last one? Yeah, just wonderful. Last one. I've got my exponent on the outside. I think most people would bring those in. That would become, oh, actually, I have to take it to the bottom too. Almost forgot. So it would become 8 squared x to the 4 y squared. In the denominator, 6 squared x squared. On the red one, the 3 would come in to become 3 cubed, which means to the power of 3. x to the power of 4 times 3, which is 12. y to the power of 3 times 3, which is 9. When I look at this, I see 8 squared on the top and I see 6 squared on the bottom. And I realize I have a coefficient on top and a coefficient on the bottom. So I'm going to have to do that coefficient trick. But I can't do that unless I know what those numbers equal. So I'm going to evaluate those coefficients. 8 squared becomes 64. The x to the 4, y squared stays the same. In the denominator, 6 squared becomes 36. Everything else stays the same on the bottom. <coughs> on the right side, 3 cubed is 27. X12, Y9 stays the same. Yes, sir? Pardon? Will that be the answer? Or... Not yet, because um, I can do more. And you didn't have to do it this way, so you might have got the right answer and done a different way. I'm just showing kind of what I think would be the best, smoothest way through. The reason I evaluated those numbers was so that I could combine my coefficients. If I look, I have a 64 on the top, 36 on the bottom. 64 doesn't divide by 36. However, both numbers do divide by something. They both divide by 2. They actually both divide by 4. Yeah, they should both divide by 4. I had to think that one through. Um, I think they both divide by 8. 8, 16, 24, 30. No, they don't. I lied to you. Um, they both divide by, I think that's the biggest number they both divide by. So then we need to go to those coefficients and divide both of them by 4. That means on the top, I should get 16. 16 on the bottom, I should get 9. Then I also have x's on the top that match with my x's on the bottom. x to the 4 divided by x squared would be x to the power of 2 on the top. The y squared I can't do anything with, so it stays as y squared. The other fraction, there is no other fraction, uh, and there's nothing that can simplify, so I'm just going to rewrite it out. All right, now I have to find a way to combine this first statement with this second statement. The first one's a fraction, the second one's not. So that sometimes confuses people when you write things out. Realistically, everything is a fraction. If you don't think it's a fraction, make it a fraction and just put a one as your placeholder on the bottom. By doing that, what you now have is two fractions being multiplied together. 
That means you can combine across the top, you can combine across the bottom. So across the top, if I go 16 times 27, I need my calculator for that. Somebody wants to punch that at 16 times 27. 132? 432, that sounds about right. 16 times 27 is 432. X squared times X to 12 would become X to the 14. Y squared, Y to the 9 becomes Y to the 11. In the denominator, 9 times 1 would just be 9. I don't think that's going to work. That pencil sharpener is broken. Jake, that pencil sharpener doesn't work. Yeah. I'll get you a better one. Just give me a second. Yes, sir. You may, yeah. Okay, we're almost done. Your last step is that you have two coefficients. One is on the top. One is on the bottom. They actually can divide. So if you went and did 432 divided by 9, it would work. And you should have 48. Yeah. So you have 48 x14 y to the 11. And that would be your final answer. Craziness. Okay, the rest are for you to practice. I'm also going to hand out a practice.